When last we left off, Geppetto was surrounded by mage cops, and so decided to knock himself out and in the process summon a Force 14 free spirit, a proxy for his mentor spirit, adversary, into his body. I'll continue in the next post. Wildcard was surveying the news with his limited Matrix connection. He had been following the special on DPI specialists uncover a black magician with dread. As he watched a dozen gunmen perforate Geppetto on live TV, then follow up with spells, that dread certainly did not abate. As the bullets in question blasted outward from Geppetto's frame in a greenish fireball of death, that dread continued to not abate and, in fact, increased. His eyes flooded black with the hollow nothingness that exists in the heart of a murderer. Geppetto took one look at the helicopter cameraman and then the feed abruptly cut out. Although the audio of a dozen men screaming in incredible, unearthly pain remained for about a half second longer. Wildcard sent Brianna a message. I think Geppetto may have just ended his career, Brianna. I'm still okay for now. Over and out. Wildcard recognized his mistake and began packing his bag again even before Brianna sent a message back. They are tracking me, dipshit. Ditch your hiding spot. Wildcard was out the door and on the sidewalk, making for the nearest metro station, within half a minute. With his mask and his duffel bag, he looked like Johnny Nobody, average salaryman. He calmly took the escalator down, approached the nearest maintenance closet, produced an auto piker and, pretending desperately like he belonged, slipped the auto piker into the lock. Jimming the door free of the lock, he popped into the closet long enough to get a maintenance jumpsuit over his suit. And then began working his way down the maintenance catwalks in the subway tunnel, making for the barrens, where he could split off into the abandoned tunnel sections. He felt around in his bag for his assault rifle, he'd need it, where he was going. Wildcard slowly walked the length of the sprawl from Renton to Redmond, just using the subway tunnels. Eventually he hit an old barrier, wooden chain link fence, mostly, between the abandoned subway tunnels and the active ones. And a few minutes with a wire cutter and a hatchet from his duffel bag had him moving again, albeit through much less friendly environs. The tunnels beneath Redmond weren't as well mapped, and they saw overlap with the sewers, impromptu basements created by building collapses, and the odd bug spirit hive. Wildcard donned his mask and switched on the night vision, priming his smart link for action. Every once in a while his boots crunched on something that he didn't care to observe, and he had to avoid tensing up. Panicking was his worst enemy in a scenario like this. He dropped to a crouch and slowly worked his way along a wall when he spotted lamplight and heard voices coming from an abandoned subway station. Shadows on the opposite wall showed three men with handguns flanking a large box of some kind, and two men in some sort of armor with assault rifles standing across from them. Activating his headphones selective sound filters, Wildcard started to pick up bits of the conversation. A synthesized voice, distorted by means of some sort of vocoder device, announced. We've been over this. Your payment was half up front. We're not paying your gang double for the goods, that wasn't part of the deal. A more recognizable voice, a male, human probably, retorted. Well, you didn't warn us about the level of heat going into this. We say cough up double or we walk and take it to your competitors. Vocoder shouted back. You and I both know that we have no competitors. The Seattle Underground is ours. Piss off. You have 3 seconds to back away before we take the merchandise by force. 1. Twofuck. The shadows of the three men pulled sidearms. One of them managed to pop off a few shots which went wild before all three were promptly put down in a volley of fire from the two armored men. One of the armored men immediately ran to the corpses and put a single bullet in each of their heads before pulling a knife and squatting over the bodies. The other ran to the box, popped the top off with a plasticine click, and breathed a heavily distorted sigh. Merch still there this voice was different. Distorted in the same way that the previous voice was, but still a distinctly separate male voice. Wildcard guessed that it was probably the corpse squatter. The first voice replied. Merch is still there. Not as much as promised, though. With a horrible squelching noise, the squatting figure stood up from the bodies. It's why John doesn't make a point of dealing with go gangers. We use the 162S for a reason when we want quality merch, not freelancers. Let's beat feet before we attract the rusted stilettos. As the two men approached his position, Wildcard loudly cleared his throat. Both of the shadows tensed and raised their rifles. The second voice shouted. Who's there? Back away and we won't hurt you. I rather doubt that, 
said Wildcard, which is why I'm not showing myself. I'm not looking for invisibility so much as protection. There was a pause. Go on. You gentlemen sound like you belong to a reputable criminal org somewhere on the unfriendly side of the law. I like that. You see, I happen to be a runner, on the run from the law, and I was looking for some place to lie low. I can pay or work, or both. Amenable? There was another pause, as the two mystery men made hushed whispers to each other, which came off more like radio static. One of them put his hand to the side of his head, probably calling in another opinion. You don't ask any questions and help us get this shipment of merchandise back to our home turf, Shadowrunner, and we'll give you a place to kip out for 500 a week. Deal? Deal. You don't get the 500 till we get back safely, though, said Wildcard, stepping out into the open. He was confronted by two men wearing Mitsuhamari hazard suits, outfitted with makeshift PPP armor additions. The glass on the hazard suit's hermetically sealed faceplates was polarized. Wildcard couldn't see an inch of skin on either man. Very well. What's the merchandise? Hearts, mostly, but we didn't get a chance to check. Wildcard gulped. Cow hearts? Guess again. It was about this point in the session that I was seriously starting to wonder if we were about to have a TPK on our hands. I remember frantically going through every cheesy item in my inventory, some of it left over from back in the trout days, trying to prep for the inevitable ass reaming that would be headed my way. As it turns out. Well, I guess I'll just let 2D tell it. I'm telling you. I don't know your sister. And if she looked like you I definitely wouldn't have fucked her. Don't. Dervish punched the offending lowlife in the face, knocking a few teeth out and rendering the guy completely unconscious before stomping out of the baron's bar. The surrounding gangers clapped and cheered. As Dervish exited the bar, Bend materialized next to him, holding a large sack full of links. You snag some more? Yeah, about six off the crowd, seven if you count the guy you just decked. Most of them look to be disposables, though. Still. We can use him to stay off the radar and sell a couple off when funds are getting low. Ben straddled the back of Dervish's bike, keeping an eye out for any tails as Dervish climbed onto the front. Dervish was still wearing his mil-spec armor, too paranoid to take it off while they were Universal Omnitech's most wanted. Think Wildcard or Geppetto made it? Dunno. If we can hook up with them, we'll talk about whether we want to lay low then try to pick up the mission again, or just fucking bail. Dervish kicked the engine into motion, and the two runners tore across the busted streets of the barons. As they pulled onto the roof of an old parking structure, the sky above them began to darken noticeably. Or, oh, fuck. Are the smog spirits out today? Goddamn toxics. Ben squinted, turning an eye skyward. No, that's, oh, oh shit. Cackling madly, Geppetto pinwheeled through the sky, his flight spell faltering. He trailed blood in long arcs through the air, spiraling towards the ground. He seemed very intent on landing near to Dervish and Bend. Dervish growled. He's going to slow down, right? He didn't. With a painful snap noise, Geppetto landed on the parking structure, bounced, skidded, and then ground to a stop. The impact and the rain of blood from above left the immediate area around Geppetto resembling a schlocky horror flick. Bend ran over to Geppetto's body. How'd you find us? Geppetto. Geppetto grinned up at the team. This would not have been a problem if his body weren't face down. As it were, his head was about 75 degrees backwards. His arms twitched and spasmed, before drooping into lifelessness one digit at a time. Geppetto isn't home right now, but you can leave a message. Dervish stood over Geppetto, looking over Geppetto's blood-soaked jacket. Fuck, adversary. Is it, now? In the process, his fedora fell off, revealing that Geppetto was missing most of the right side of his face. His right eyeball dangled like a yo-yo from a massive crater in his head. I didn't notice. Jesus, man. Bend coughed up a few more dry heaves before wiping his mouth. We've got to get you to a hospital. Considering I'm the only thing keeping your cocky little teammate alive right now, agreed adversary in a sing-song voice, I'd second that assessment. Of course, where oh where are we ever going to find a hospital free of universal Omnitech pharmaceuticals interference? And if we find that, how about a hospital that accepts banshees? I'd put my hands on my cheeks dramatically but, what do you know, I'm paralyzed. Dervish snapped his fingers. In the armor, it made a clang noise. 2D's buddy. What was his name, John? The Taminous guy. 
The ghoul. Taminus runs a hospital only a few miles from here. Better get me there fast. Chuckles. Giggled adversary. I'm beginning to stop hurting, and not in the good way. Loading Geppetto's broken body into the sidecar, the team sped for the Taminus hospital. At the gate of the Taminus compound, John T.S.K. at least as well as anyone could T.S.K. T.S.K. while not having lips. A year ago, this man came into this hospital in a similar state. I turned him into a banshee to spare his pain. Look at what difference it has made. Look, said Dervish, impatient, can you save him or not? Likely not, responded John, adjusting his tie with a funerary flair, but I can try. We refurbished the waiting room if you wish to stay there for the night. There's another runner renting it out, but something tells me you'll be amenable roommates. He could be a bounty hunter, noted Bend, unconvinced. John turned and began walking back into the hospital as two ghouls gingerly loaded Geppetto onto a stretcher. You'll work it out. You runner types do tend to get along with each other. John turned back briefly. Oh, and if you have open wounds, please ask one of my aides for one of the hazard suits from the basement. It wouldn't do well to infect all of my clientele. Well, whoever this mystery runner is, said Dervish, as he stepped into the waiting room, he'd better not fuck with me. Wouldn't dream of it, Dervish, responded Wildcard. Oh, good to see you're alive. Likewise, responded Wildcard, tapping at an AR screen. Was that bloke with half a face Geppetto? It was three days later when the team was allowed into the recovery ward to see Geppetto. The recovery ward was a dismal place, given that it hadn't been used for a medical recovery since Geppetto went under the first time, and not for years before that. Geppetto was loosely cogent. He still resembled, more than anything, a marionette with its strings cut, and being devoid of all of his trademark clothes made him look awfully exposed. His body was covered with bandages of all varieties. John spoke as he undid the bandages around Geppetto's head. It was a miracle that we managed to fix your spine. You'll walk again, soon, even, but the nerve damage is permanent. You'll probably never feel much in your extremities again. With the amount of muscle tissue we had to clone, you'll also be weak. If you insist on going back on the job, I'd recommend putting you on crutches, a cane at least. My face, Geppetto rasped. Tell me about my face. John grimaced. It was a hideous thing, all teeth and bleached, atrophying gums. Well, we repaired it. Mostly. Geppetto's face had mostly recovered, although around his right eye was a mess of scar tissue. He had no eyebrow to speak of, and even the eye itself was set a little differently from its twin. What was more disturbing was the trickle of orangish red liquid out of what used to be Geppetto's tear ducts. Geppetto snarled when he looked in the mirror. What the hell is that? It's cerebrospinal fluid. When we were reattaching the ocular nerve, your regeneration kept kicking in. It thought that your eyelids, lacerated as they were, were a wound and kept sealing over your eye. We had to create an incision and hold it open long enough for the regeneration to slow. Your eye may be permanently damaged, but more pressing is the seepage of the fluid into your tear ducts. You'll have to come in for periodic checks, but it should be harmless. Harmless? With a burst of magic, Geppetto smashed the mirror. You call leaking my brains out my eye harmless? Technically, Geppetto, the fluid around your brain. And you're lucky that you survived in the first place. Wildcard somberly stepped forward. Look. Geppetto. We can call up the Johnson. Get this whole thing called off. Geppetto grabbed Wildcard by the throat with a deceptive strength, shutting him up. Arduously, with pain evident in every motion, he drew Wildcard closer to himself. No, Wildcard. We're finishing this mission. We're finishing this mission because I've lost too fucking much already, and I'm not prepared to make it all for nothing. The team gathered around a table in what was once the old hospital cafeteria. The plates and trays were still in use by the hospital's infected inhabitants, but the cafeteria slop was a little, bloody now. Geppetto greedily, shamelessly sucked the blood out of a piece of unidentifiable human meat, occasionally choking a bit when the fluid leaking from his eye dripped down over his nose and mouth. Wildcard, Bend, and Dervish did their best not to cringe. Okay, so here's what we've got, said Dervish, gesturing to one of the comlinks in the phone sack. I managed to get a hold on one of Brianna's disposables, UO doesn't know about it. She says she's working on a distraction that will take some of the heat off us. She says to wait a few days for couriers to distribute the information off the UO research nexus, though. Wildcard nodded. I figured as much. Geppetto, 
I hope you don't mind that, since we're going to be late on our week deadline. I called up Mr. Johnson and got us a week extension. Johnson halved our pay. Geppetto grumbled, but nodded slowly. That's fair, we fucked up, big time. I'm thinking our first step is to retrieve the camera. Uo thought we were trying a detastial. On the plus side, that means that they won't be looking carefully for an extraction. Ben gawked. You want me to go back in there? Geppetto stared him down. With his new facial features, it was more imposing than usual. Yes, I want you to go back in there, bend, and do your goddamn job. And then you're going to go in there again to get Dr. Chang's research files. Assuming they're not getting transferred. It was the dawn of the second week when the invisible kangaroo hopped through the backyards of the suburbs around the UO compound, keeping an eye out for any flying drones. The coast was clear, but there were loud noise coming from the compound, and the sound of approaching police cars from the suburbs. As Bend approached the compound, he found the source, a group of runners in what looked to be Enra's sitter master had broken through the fence. With a thunker thunker thunker, a troll with an assault cannon carved his way through a line of stall traffic, sending the UO whitecoats taking cover on the other side stumbling. Screaming civilians ran for the safety of the archaeology. Bend returned to his natural elven form and popped earbuds, calling up Brianna's backup number. Hey, Brianna? Your little fix for the problem wouldn't have been sending a bunch of runners on a job at the UO complex, would it? Technically, not my fix. I just let people down the fixer network grapevine know that UO was sending out couriers in response to a detastial. Eventually somebody would do something stupid, UO would clean up, and the heat would be off you boys. Bend nodded appreciatively, not that Brianna could have seen it even if she was there. Clever. Man, they are going full terrorist out there. The helicopter that had assaulted Wildcard a few days ago passed the compound in a strafing run. And with an extended volley of minigun fire the right side of the troll's upper body turned into a pink mist. A mil-spec suited gun Sammy and a taxolited infiltrator dragged a screaming white suit into the back of the sitter master. And that'd be one of the couriers. Man, the business breeds some dumb runners. How do they think they are going to get out of this? I don't think you get to talk about dumb runners today, Bend. Touché. Bend slipped over the perimeter fence as a white painted SWAT tank rumbled up from the depths of the parking structure. As he slipped into the employee village, there was a cacophonic exchange of fire, and then silence, save for the rattle of a few more distant small arms and withering suppressive fire. I think that about does it for our scapegoats. Lucky way to take them out, too. Scorched the bodies so they can't say for sure if we were in there or not. Although I'm not sure I approve of glorified human shield tactics, Brianna. Runner solidarity and all that. There's a lot you don't approve of, Bend. If you need any more help, call me up. With that, Ben's comms went silent. Approaching Chang's house, Ben found the lights off, but the flower bushes had been disturbed again. Fishing around for a moment, he recovered the hairpin. Pocketing it, he wasted no time in getting back out of the UO complex before UO got wise to the fact that there were more runners than accounted for on the premises. The team reviewed their footage back in their Ghoul Hospital temporary base. Chang had been incredibly thorough, over the course of a few days, she'd found an excuse to walk through almost every relevant floor, office to office, lab to lab. She'd even brought a batch of cupcakes to the guys in the security nexus. What was most interesting was the AR displays with which she worked. Her research remained on the nexus, from what the team could gather, it was chemical data on a new line of experimental smart immunosuppressants. The team began to formulate a plan. If we can special order a ceramic simrig, commented Wildcard, we could sneak it into her office and have her wear it. Then just go through all of her research systematically before deleting it off the system. There'd be no record of an unauthorized copy, but all of the research would exist on the Simpsons recording. Bend whined. I'm going to have to deal with the eyes, again, aren't I? Oh, take one for the team, Bend, spat Geppetto, fiddling with his wheelchair. Lord knows I have. Bend approached the unmarked grey van. It had parked outside of the Taminus hospital at his call. It waited. Ominously, it waited. As he approached, the side door slid open, beckoning him to enter. All the seats and upholstery had been removed, and there was a barrier separating the driver from the empty space in back. Of course, Bend had no doubt that the driver wasn't actually in the van at all, but rather rigging it remotely. As he stepped into back, there was a PFFT as the van began flooding with Neurostin and Mzo. 
Ben sighed loudly, in the process breathing deep of the chemical cocktail. He awoke, as per the usual, blindfolded and tied to a chair. Between this and the talismanga Vulcan, Ben was getting used to this sort of thing. A synthesized voice asked. What do you need, son? Bend cleared his throat of some lingering phlegm neurost and did tend to do a number on the sinuses and answered. A simrig. Plastic and ceramic components. We need as little wiring in it as possible, or if that's impossible, we need the electronics to be shielded. I want to be able to walk through a mad scanner. That's going to cost you. I know. Five grand good? The voice barked back. Six thousand. How about five and a quarter? Six thousand. Five and a half? Six thousand. Ben didn't know why he bothered trying to barter with the eyes. Done. Two days? Three. Sounds good. Pay. With a thunk, a neurostin syringe planted itself in Ben's arm. He woke up sprawled outside the hospital again. I hate that guy. Wildcard asked. You sure you're up for this, Ben? The team sat in the sedan a few blocks away from the UO complex. Ben took a deep breath, let it out, and then extended his arms to Wildcard. As much as I'll ever be. You've got the portable mad scanner. Scan me. Wildcard ran the scanner over Ben while Ben grumbled aloud, patronizingly. Magic isn't everything, Ben. You should get some cyberware, Ben. Who cares if you pop in mad scanners, Ben. Well, look at me now. I don't know if any of us, specifically, ever told you that, Ben, said Wildcard, putting away the scanner. You're clean. Get in there and get out quick. We can't help you once you're inside. Dervish and I will be armed up if you get spotted on the way out, though. Ben nodded, his joking edge losing ground to his on-the-job persona. Right. Wish me luck. Godspeed. Ben stepped out of the car, and then vanished into thin air as he made for the hole in the perimeter fence. Ben approached the employee entrance, and worked his way up the veritable labyrinth of security measures on the interior. Most of the weapon scanners, metal detectors, and such could be gecko gripped over, or slipped past. A few doors required employee IDs. In those cases, he could simply lift an it off an employee or, more commonly, follow an employee in. Only one mad scanner in particular had laser triggers and pressure pads around it to prevent circumvention, and it was at the end of the employee partition before the research labs. Stealing himself, he slipped through just before one of the researchers, but the alarm didn't trigger. Instead, the researcher and the guard made small talk about the latest urban brawl match while Ben disappeared into the employee hallways. The labs of the UO complex were decidedly less sinister than Ben thought they would be. Although they continued in the theme of the pristine white aesthetic, no one was doing any horrible surgeries or torturing any secret prisoners. Mostly it was a bunch of people working with gloves in a sealed containers, and more than that researchers seated at desks, in offices and cubicles. Carrying out their research via remote mechanical hands and sealed laboratories near to the research nexus. Even more were simply reviewing and editing research documents. The UO doctors were chatty and cliquish, often standing over each other's desks to talk about their latest accomplishments. Jennifer Chang sat at her desk, adjusted for her small size, while eating her lunch. She tooled around with her research, pretending to work, when an elf appeared next to her, placing a subvocal mic over her throat. Once again, she was startled, but not surprised. Idiot. There's a camera. Bend pointed to the camera on the ceiling. That one? There's a trid phantasm of you slacking off on the job while eating a chicken wrap over the lens. Smart. That doesn't mean you're not a week late, Sean. We renegotiated. I need your help getting your research off the Nexus. Your extraction is tomorrow. Chang shook her head. I can't make copies. I can only view the research from my desk node. Ben produced the small spy toy simrig. I know. It's why I brought this. Chang's eyes lit up. Ingenious. Stick around for 20 minutes, and for the love of god turn your cloak back on. Chang tucked the simrig into place, and adjusted her lab coats and hair to cover it. Slowly, systematically, she went through every one of her research notes in review, occasionally taking the time to spin 3D models of various chemical chains around in AR space. She was approached by co-workers a few times, but would always shoo them off, saying that she thought she was onto something, and would catch up to them later. After almost exactly 20 minutes, she detached the simrig and handed it back to Bend. All my data should be on here, now. Where's the extraction going down? 
keep your com link on, as Ben disappeared back into the halls, making for the employee partition again, he tapped his sub vehicle and hit up wildcard. Wildcard. Stage 2. As Chang went down to grab a small dessert with her handlers, her com link was hacked. A single message was left, which read, Hello, Dr. Jennifer Chang, and welcome to the exchange. As you head down to the mall, please take the escalator up and down twice before heading out. You will then receive a karmic reward. Back in the car, Dervish grunted at Wildcard. I still think this is a stupid idea. Everyone knows the exchange, Dervish. Everyone knows the exchange is weird as hell. How do you know her handlers will go along with this? It's free stuff. Hard to turn down free stuff. As soon as Bent verified that Chang did indeed take the escalator multiple times before heading down again. Wildcard used one of his scrap com links to buy three tickets to one of the latest late summer blockbuster shitfests. Congratulations, Dr. Chang. You have won three tickets to Suki Red Flower for the Half Moon Conspiracy. The exchange personalizes your karmic rewards based on your preferences. Have a nice day. Bent caught his last glimpse of Dr. Jennifer Chang, staring blankly at her cum link, as he slipped out of the UO Arcology. Devish waited in the movie theater lobby. He had cut his hair short, had grown out a bit of a beard, and had his protective Sibri covers retracted, to avoid being an obvious match to Duck Steel, UO Fugitive. Ben sat behind the three seats reserved for Chang and her handlers, not in his usual tactical gear but rather in his inconspicuous street clothes. Wildcard and Geppetto, the latter of whom was still very weak, were parked outside the theater in Wildcard's now silver sedan. She's not going to show, commented Dervish over the tacnet. Yes she is, Wildcard shot back. Never underestimate the power of free, greed short circuits the mind. Have you seen the reviews? It's the worst movie of the summer, Ben plucked up a few pieces of popcorn individually, eating them in the absolute wrong way to eat popcorn. Not to mention apparently there's a twist where Suki loses all her powers due to a negative background count, and then awakens again into a different tradition. Now, that's just offensive, commented Geppetto. These studios really need to have mages on staff when they write up shit like that, a 5 year old could tell them that's not how it works. You complain about this and I complain about the inaccuracies in every Fast and the Furious trade ever made, threatened Wildcard. Your move, gentlemen. There was a short pause. Geppetto snickered, daubed at his eye goo with a handkerchief, and turned to Wildcard. You've watched every Fast and the Furious trade? That wasn't what I meant and you know it. You have absolutely watched every Fast and the Furious trade. Dr. Jennifer Chang stepped out of the car, flanked by two bored looking white suits. She was playing up the devout fangirl angle to a T. I swear, back in Suki Red Flower 3 I swore that she loved Rex Carlson, but it turned out that she was really in love with Lu Peng, from that secret guild of assassins. Jenny, I know. We've been over this. Know that we're going to this movie as a favor to you. Jennifer sighed melodramatically. I know. Hey. Let's get a hot dog. I haven't been to the theaters in forever. Chang gave Bend a brief. Knowing glance as she sat in front of him, before being flanked by her two guards. Bend nodded subtly, but kept his eyes on the screen. About 30 minutes into the movie, Bend stepped outside. He made a point of being louder than usual, making excuse me comments to the people on either side of him. About 6 minutes afterwards, Chang stepped out to go to the bathroom. Although one handler followed her to the bathroom door, Bend was already inside, with an invisibility effect on him, maintained by Geppetto. Activating his foci, Ben cast a body double effect on Chang. While the real Chang waited in the bathroom, Dervish began making a commotion in the lobby, screaming about a lack of sweetness in his frosted confection. With her bodyguard momentarily distracted, Chang stepped out into the lobby long enough for Geppetto to look in through the facade of the movie theater, sitting in the car. With a quick spell, he rendered her invisible. The body double stepped out of the bathroom a moment later, puppeted by Ben. It asked the guard. What's that guy's problem? I don't know, Jenny. I think he's diabetic or something. Let's get back into the theater. Bend paid attention to the body double long enough to walk it back to its seat, and then set it on a looping series of oohs, ahs, and popcorn munching. The real doctor stepped into the back of Wildcard's car, and was swiftly rejoined by Bend. As the ushers came running, Dervish also left the theater, returning to his motorbike. Dr. Chang leaned over to Wildcard. The rendezvous point is in Snahamish. 
Is this a fast car? Lady, you have no idea. After a surprisingly uneventful, save for wildcards absolute destruction of the local traffic laws, drive, the team pulled up in front of a farmhouse in Snahamish. Two men in black suits carrying HK submachine guns opened the back doors of the sedan, and Dr. Chang conversed quietly with them before going inside the farmhouse. One of the men said, blankly, in an imposing fashion that seemed almost at odds with the content of his message. Mr. Johnson will meet your team for lunch tomorrow at quarter past 12, at the Nacho Mama near the Auburn Shopping Center on Main Street West. Geppetto blinked. Mr. Johnson is meeting us for fast food Mexican? He was in the mood. That's a little insulting. The guy turned around and began stalking back towards the house. That's not for me to say. Good day, sir. As the car pulled away, Geppetto growled. They were fucking with us. As though less than absolute perfection is insulting. Wildcard gripped his steering wheel tight, tense. I think they were within their rights, Geppetto. How? We did the fucking job, that's all they can ask. Wildcard turned to look Geppetto right in the eyes, and revealed. Their air feeds. All the text was in German. Geppetto took a moment to put two and two together. Oh, oh fuck. Dervish asked, over the tacnet. Sue, tacos with cedar croup? Ben nodded soberly. Tacos with cedar croup? Mr. Johnson was a strange sight. To keep within the theme of dressing much lower than his station, he was wearing a powder blue business suit with rumpled shoulders. Considering that Johnson himself was a man of impeccable handsomeness and poise, it was a little weird to see him snarfing down a burrito at a fast food Mexican restaurant. Gentlemen, I heard you had some minor setbacks. Ha ha, said Geppetto glumly, sliding into the booth after putting his crutches aside. I laughed. You know exactly what happened, Mr. Johnson, noted wildcard, while punching in an order for the works nachos on the table's AR display. And we're prepared to accept half pay. We did get Chang out as ordered, though. Yes, and you needed to pull in a time extension and, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of favors, counted Mr. Johnson, with a smile. His statuesque face was marred by a little bit of shredded cheese stuck on his lip. Consider this you boys wake up call. Johnson brought out a cred stick with 50,000 million on it, and gave it to Wildcard, before forwarding half of the expense account to Wildcard's comlink. But you still did a good job in the end, so I'm prepared to make you an offer. Geppetto looked at Mr. Johnson suspiciously. Oh. Your fixler is just getting into the big leagues, and I'm a very important Johnson. I can pass word around, let everyone know that you and your guys are up for the big stuff, and she's the way to contact you. I'll vouch for you personally on the Johnson Networks. You might even get rich out of it. What do you say? Wildcard nodded. That sounds quite amenable, Mr. Johnson. Bend nodded, although less swiftly than Wildcard. Yes, I agree. I hope we're professional enough for it. Devish grinned at Mr. Johnson. Hell, I've been waiting for a big break since my first milk run. A mutual good-natured laugh sounded around the table. Geppetto stood up, a thin smile on his lips. Get a new mage, you suicidal fucks. I quit. With that, Geppetto retrieved his crutches and began slowly making his way out of the Nacho Mama. After about a minute of stunned silence, Johnson asked, Who's gonna eat his taco? Shadow Run Story Time 15 End. Geppetto's face when. You know, I was actually really worried for Geppetto in this one, although he came back almost stronger, you know, it was, it was whenever he was sitting talking to Ben, it was... It was unusual, though. It, 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 it felt like there was an awful lot more going on there than w was shown, you know? It felt like there was more under the surface. But no, it's really good to see the team, like, is doing really well. But they're growing up in the world, and things are getting more and more dangerous. And, you know, even if Darvish is thinking, like, you know, this could be a party wipe here. Like, you know, I'm, I'm getting to a point where I'm feeling a bit too invested. And I don't want it all in a, sh end in a little shit show, you know? But then again, that's Shadowgun, isn't it? Like, you know, it's a very hyper-violent universe, and it's got that very dark and gritty feel to it, you know? And pff, I suppose if it all ends in a... If it all ends in bloodshed, then I suppose it would wrap it up nicely, you know? It, it wouldn't be out of character for the universe to be like that, you know? But I don't know. I don't know. We're coming closer and closer to the end, and, look, we'll just see what happens. I hope you boys have been enjoying Shadowgun Week anyway. 
I'm away on holiday at the minute, so look, I'm sorry, this is the best. If you're not into Shadowgun, I keep saying this, if you're not into Shadowgun, sorry about that, but I'm sure if you're listening to this right now, you more than likely are into Shadowgun, so not bad. You get a lot of Shadowgun this week, which is pretty cool, because I love this story. But look, guys, I'm gambling, so look, um, as always, links down below, maybe subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! What the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services. It's time to stop!